Good evening or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Carl Wood, and I work with the Parties Education Commission. And uh, tonight we're going to be doing uh, part two of a presentation on Marxist political economy. Uh, Tuesday, we went through uh, the first section, which focused on the uh, the political economy that uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels developed in uh, in the 19th century, and uh, trying to deal with how capitalism worked in its beginnings, uh, in its early stages. Uh, and today we're going to get into uh, what capitalism looks like in uh, the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, there were tremendous uh, uh, theoretical contributions, as well as, of course, practical contributions, were made by Lenin uh, just before the uh, Russian Revolution, and we're going to be getting into some of that as well. Uh, a lot of the focus today is going to be on the features of modern capitalism. So we will uh, hopefully, well, not just hopefully, we will have uh, plenty of time, I think, for questions and comments from the audience, from participants. And so if questions come up in your mind during the presentation, please make a little note of it. And uh, when you uh, offer those questions or comments at the end, then we can have some discussion and response to them. So uh, in just a minute, I'm going to launch into the real formal structure of the presentation. But uh, what we're talking about, as I said today, is going to be capitalism in the modern world, and uh, which of course is uh, a little different from the world that Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels lived in. And uh, in a lot of respects, it's different from the world that Vladimir Lenin uh, lived in as well. Uh, there have been tremendous changes that have happened over that period of time, but the essence of capitalism, the essence of exploitation, uh, of oppression that goes with this system uh, has not really changed. And it just, it takes new forms and we have to constantly be keeping up with it so that we can respond and, and work towards a transition to a new society that will be fair and decent, uh, equitable and peaceful for everybody in the world. Well, with, with those comments, I'd like to begin the actual presentation. Um, my cell phone just dinged, so I'd better silence it before I disrupt my own presentation. Um, uh, as I said, this is part two of uh, the presentation on the political economy of modern capitalism. I'm going to focus on a couple of things uh, that I'd like people to take away from this class. My experience in making presentations is that people don't uh, don't retain everything that's presented to them. That would be uh, sort of a foolish and naive expectation. And so I try to focus on a couple of key concepts that uh, I would hope that people will walk away from this class with. And uh, these are the ones that I'm going to try to focus on. First of all, what are the characteristics of imperialism, which is the highest stage of capitalism? Second, who makes up the modern working class? Uh, and what is the composition of the capitalist class today? Uh, those may seem obvious, but in fact, they're, they're subjects of great controversy uh, on both sides of the class line, both among uh, progressives and within the ruling class itself. And third, I'm going to talk about super exploitation, uh, special types of exploitation and the implications of that, uh, which are major features of modern imperialism, modern capitalism. So. Uh, when we go through all of this, I'll loop back and, and mention these again, and you can maybe think about whether you have actually had uh, some takeaways that uh, stay with you around these subjects. Now, during the lifetimes of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, uh, capitalism looked a lot different from the way it looks today. 
uh, it was before the period of widespread, not just industrialization, but automation and cybernetics. And uh, the type of, of business uh, establishments that existed tended to be smaller than what we see today, although they were growing as they consolidated. And there is also uh, competition among different ca capitalists uh, in both in the same industries and in different industries. So that if there were different manufacturers, for example, of, uh, of textiles, they would compete against each other. There wasn't the kind of consolidation that we have seen happen since the end of the 19th century. But by the beginning of the 20th century, monopoly got the upper hand in the main capitalist countries. Uh, that was probably most pronounced in the United States, but it was also true in Britain, in France, in Germany, and it was beginning to be true in Japan as well, and to a lesser degree in some of the other capitalist countries. And in the United States, for example, uh, the first real monopoly that we saw emerge was uh, the railroads. And that, of course, was because the very nature of that technology makes it into a monopoly. It didn't make any sense uh, economically, practically, to have two rail lines starting in the same place, ending in the same place, going parallel to each other and competing against each other. And so uh, railroads were, from the time of their inception, they were monopolies. But other types of monopolies started to be formed during the late 19th century. And they took different forms during that period. Uh, some of these words may be familiar, but maybe not the application so much. There were, for example, cartels. Cartels are uh, informal or sometimes formal arrangements between different enterprises, different companies that uh, have been competing against each other, but figure out that they can make a lot more money if they stop competing and just cooperate with each other and fix prices and fix the terms of the, uh, of the service and conditions of service and the uh, delivery of goods and so forth. Uh, the limitation of cartels is that they tended to be unstable. The, uh, when one of the cartel partners decided that they could uh, get the upper hand, they would frequently betray their other cartel uh, partners. Uh, in the modern world, we don't see too many cartels, although there's one or two that are very famous. The, uh, the oil cartel, for example, um, the, uh, which is really a monopoly arrangement among countries that produce uh, oil and natural gas. And uh, again, we can see the effectiveness of it in fixing prices and driving prices up, but also the instability of it as uh, different participants may pursue their own agendas rather than the agenda of the cartel. Uh, syndicates were another form that monopolies took and probably the usage that we're most familiar with when we talk about the syndicate, we talk about organized crime. And organized crime is certainly a form of uh, capitalist monopoly. Uh, again, uh, it relies on deals that are made between the uh, participants and they tend to be somewhat unstable because the syndicate partners uh, tend to betray each other when the opportunity is there for uh, getting the upper hand and getting an advantage. So by the end of the 19th century, we started seeing the emergence of uh, the, mo the more modern form of monopoly, which is uh, technically called a trust, but it just means a, a big corporation. It means a sim single company that controls a large part of sometimes all of a particular industry. Um, some of the earliest examples were the standard oil monopoly, for example. But of course, railroads fall into that category. And gradually, uh, really towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we saw industry after industry here in the United States become uh, monopolized in trusts, the rubber industry, the cement industry, uh, the various uh, 
metal extraction and smelting industries like copper, uh, the steel industry, of course. And uh, there were two general types of organization of trusts, which were called vertical and horizontal. Horizontal, uh, well, let's start with vertical. Vertical means that a single company controls the manufacture of a particular commodity from beginning to end. And so, for example, uh, in the steel industry, the steel monopoly would control the mining of iron ore, the mining of, of coking coal. It would control the uh, sometimes the transportation of those raw materials to the steel mill. It would, of course, control the steel mill, which con converted the raw materials into a, a semi-finished product, into iron and then into steel. And then it would complete the process of transforming the steel into a, uh, a, a commodity that could be sold on the market, such as sheet metal or uh, ingot or uh, girders, things like that. Uh, so vertical meant that a single company controlled the industry from, from bottom to top. The horizontal trust, on the other hand, involved a single company or a small number of companies controlling a single process. Uh, and the best example of that uh, was the oil monopoly, where John D. Rockefeller organized the, uh, uh, his company to control the refining of oil into gasoline and other oil products. What happens with horizontal trusts is because they control one critical part of the whole production process, they tend to uh, evolve into both vertical and horizontal trusts. And so uh, for that reason, after a period of development, uh, a lot of the trusts became both horizontal and vertical. And Today, we don't usually make a big distinction there, but historically it's important because it shows how uh, various corporations, various trusts evolved. Uh, in, in the 20th century, especially in the latter part of the 20th century, we saw the emergence of conglomerates, which were single corporations that uh, had strong positions, sometimes monopoly positions in various industries. So they were, uh, an amalgam of, of uh, uh, different monopolies in different industries in a single corporation. And what we have seen also since the last part of the 20th century and now into the 21st century is a widespread development of transnationals, which mean corporations whose reach extends far beyond just the country in which they originated. Now that's not new. Um, companies, uh, lots of companies have had uh, a base in a single capitalist country, but then they've had extensions in other countries. But because of the ease of moving money around and, uh, and controlling the operation of, of countries around the world, of companies around the world without uh, any time lag, because communication today is instantaneous. Uh, the transmission of money is instantaneous. Uh, and uh, for that matter, uh, executives and bosses can move from one company to the country to another in a very short amount of time, in a day or less. So transnationals are increasingly a common form of the organization of monopoly capital in the 21st century. Uh, now, since the late 20th century, capitalism has been characterized by intensified globalization, which I just talked about a little bit, and also deregulation. Um, in its earlier days, capitalists found that it was useful to be able to legislate or otherwise through government means control the development of, of industry in order to provide themselves certain advantages and disadvantage their competitors, especially if they were competitors in other countries. But as globalization has taken place, and as uh, monopoly capital in a lot of respects has lost its national identity, uh, not completely, but to some extent, there has been a strong push 
by important sectors of the capitalist class for eliminating regulations, for deregulation, so that there won't be barriers to the free flow of capital from one place to another. So that if uh, a corporation in the United States, say, wants to build a factory in Nigeria, they don't want to see any regulations that give preferences to Nigerian capitalists over the, over the American capitalists. And so we see very widespread push towards deregulation. Of course, that process happens in the other direction too. When, uh, for example, in the United States, certain companies find that they're facing competition from companies in other countries. Uh, we see that a lot right now with uh, some of the high tech industries, especially uh, around the manufacture of, uh, of, of um, microchips and so forth uh, in China. Uh, suddenly these free market advocates become much more interested in imposing regulation and putting restrictions on the flow of capital uh, in order to maintain an advantage for the American companies. Now, um, perhaps the greatest contribution that Lenin made to uh, political economy, and uh, he made many contributions there, but uh, he was the author of a remarkable book that was published in, I think, uh, 1916, uh, right on during World War I and on the eve of the Russian Revolution, in which he identified the new form that capitalism was taking with the growth of monopoly. And uh, he published this book, it's called Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism. And it's one of the recommended books for this class. Uh, he, I won't go through all of the uh, subject matter and the title heads uh, of this book, but a couple of them I think are worth pointing out even in this brief time we have. One is that as distinct from capitalism in the 19th century, banks now play a new role. Uh, banks in the 19th century typically uh, took deposits and they made loans and uh, they generally were not directly involved with the operation and direction of particular industries or particular capitalist enterprises. Well, under imperialism, that changes. Uh, the best example that I can think of is what happened with the steel monopoly here in the United States. Uh, the industrialist Andrew Carnegie put together a huge uh, iron and steel monopoly, uh, which was called Carnegie Steel. And uh, it controlled, uh, if memory serves, about half of the iron and steel production in the United States and had a dominant role in the economy at that time. Well, when Carnegie got old enough and was thinking about retiring, he was approached by the biggest banker of that period, uh, J.P. Morgan, and he was asked uh, if he was willing to sell Carnegie Steel. And so the way the story goes is that uh, Carnegie wrote down a number on a piece of paper and handed it to J.P. Morgan. Morgan looked at it and said, okay, it's a deal. And so uh, Morgan was the biggest banker of that time. And he put together a consortium of banks to, to, to not only buy out uh, Carnegie Steel, whose name was changed then to U.S. Steel, but also to buy a number of other smaller iron and steel producers and consolidate them all into an, one giant corporation, which became U.S. Steel. It was the first billion dollar corporation back when a billion dollars actually meant something. And uh, the date of its founding was 1900. So that's a convenient date to think about the beginning of the dominance of imperialism and monopoly capital in, in the United States is the day that U.S. Steel became the first billion dollar corporation in the world. And this merger of banking and, uh, and 
industrial capital meant that big capital started to function in a different way because JP Morgan didn't know much about making steel. He knew a lot about making money. And the new form of, uh, of monopoly capitalism uh, is what Lenin called finance capital. And uh, we see evidence of that everywhere uh, with giant banks that uh, basically call the shots to a considerable degree in our society and our politics. And, uh, and many of the, uh, of the names are still the same of those great financiers from 100 years ago. Uh, out of that, we uh, have seen the emergence of uh, not just an industrial monopoly, not just the people who uh, create new businesses, uh, the Henry Fords and the uh, Andrew Carnegie's and people like that, but now great financiers who not only control the banks, they also control the industry themselves. And so there's a merging of bank capital and industrial capital. And we refer to that as the financial oligarchy. Another characteristic of this imperialist stage of development of capitalism is we see the export of capital, not only commodities. Uh, in the earlier days of capitalism, uh, the highly efficient, well-organized manufacturing countries like Great Britain would export uh, goods and, and commodities to other countries. And, uh, and there were a lot of things that followed from that. For example, uh, British imperialism was not only involved with trying to subjugate the pop population of, uh, of India and to steal their natural resources, but also to eliminate competition from uh, industries in India, which uh, were in competition with British industries. Uh, prior to the British takeover of India, India was a tremendous producer of textiles. And once the British got control, they systematically destroyed the, uh, at least the advanced, uh, technologically advanced portion of Indian textile manufacturing and prevented the further development of it in order to eliminate competition to the British industries. So, uh, but after the development of imperialism, we started seeing uh, a lot of export of capital, uh, not only those commodities like the textiles that Britain wanted to send to other countries, but also capital itself so that the British, in, in this instance, could establish their own factories in these countries and take advantage of the uh, lower standards of living in order to pay the workers even less than they were paid in their own countries. Uh, we also have seen the export of capital to highly developed countries so that, for example, uh, capitalists in the United States don't just uh, invest in less developed countries. They also invest in highly developed countries. And so, uh, for example, the uh, semiconductor industry has huge amount, the US semiconductor industry has huge amounts of investment in places like Taiwan and, uh, and some other Asian countries where conditions are uh, convenient for that. And, Whereas earlier forms of capital, capitalism, competitive capitalism, tended to create barriers to free trade in order to protect domestic capital. Uh, in the new world of imperialism, we see the promotion of what's called free trade, which means the elimination or reduction of tariff barriers to trade between countries. Uh, that's not a completely consistent policy because uh, uh, capitalists are generally less uh, committed to honoring consistency in their ideology than to figuring out ways to make more money. And when it's convenient to break the rules of free trade in order to make higher profits, they're willing to do that. Uh, we also are, have seen the formation of international monopolies, which uh, take a couple of different forms. I talked about cartels 
actually, if you go back to the period uh, just before uh, the World War I, there were some important international cartels, for example, in the electrical uh, equipment business, uh, making things like electrical generators and various other products. Uh, there was an agreement between General Electric of the United States and a similarly named company in, in Germany, also called General Electric, however you say that in German. And uh, they basically divided up the world. They said, uh, these markets belong to the United States and these other markets belong to Germany and we'll collaborate in order to keep anybody else out of those markets. Well, during World War I, they couldn't really uh, police that agreement very well because the two countries were at war with each other. But the two monopolies uh, in this cartel kept records during World War I. And after the war was over uh, and the capitalists in both countries kissed and made up, uh, they did an accounting. And all of the uh, profits that the German company made from uh, selling things to the parts of the cartel that uh, belong to the United States, they paid off the US General Electric for that and vice versa. Um, so we talk about honor among thieves. Well, there it was. Uh, those cartels are not common today, although like I mentioned before, the oil cartel uh, is still in existence. And there are a few other examples, I think, but they're not the dominant form of international monopoly. The major form is transnational companies which are co companies that may be based in a particular country, but do business across national lines. And, uh, and their stocks are sold internationally, uh, their uh, acquisition of raw materials, uh, the actual manufacture takes place all over the world in different places. Another thing that happens under imperialism is that there is a territorial division of the world among the great powers. And, uh, you know, when uh, if you think back to your high school days uh, learning about uh, European history, uh, assuming that you remember anything of that, uh, which I think most people don't because it's presented in such a boring manner, but we're told that the cause of World War I was when a Serbian nationalist uh, assassinated the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, and that that uh, and that was the cause of World War One, which resulted in, in millions and millions of deaths and uh, vast destruction of uh, countries across Europe and, and other par parts of the world. Um, in fact, uh, that wasn't the cause of World War One. Uh, prior to World War One the great capitalist powers were lining up against each other uh, in order to uh, extend their control over certain parts of the world. The, uh, the British were first to the table. They were the earliest, uh, well, they and, and to some extent Spain and, and Holland were the earliest colonial powers and uh, Spain for various reasons and Holland for various reasons weren't able to maintain large colonial empires, but Britain of course did. And, uh, and France also was able to assemble a large colonial empire. And so between those two countries, they controlled, they had colonized most of the African continent uh, as well as significant parts of Asia. And uh, the United States, while it didn't engage too much in classical colonialism from the time of the, uh, within decades of the establishment of the United States, uh, President Monroe asserted the right of US capitalism to uh, have a dominant role in the entire Western hemisphere called the Monroe Doctrine. And so that was a different form of colonialism. We call it neo-colonialism today, but basically uh, it was saying, you capitalists from other countries, you have to stay out. This is our turf. And uh, a couple of the capitalist countries 
were a little bit later in developing, but became very powerful industrial powers in their own right. And Germany and Austria were probably primary among those. And uh, But because they were late coming to the banquet, they ended up with very few colonial territories. And so the idea developed that they wanted what they call the place in the sun. In other words, they wanted the right to uh, exploit and rip off and oppress the people and steal the natural resources of important sections of the world. But those sections of the world were already controlled by, by the British, by the French, uh, in the case of uh, Indonesia, by Holland. Uh, and, uh, and the only solution to that was to go to war. And that's what they did. That's, you know, that's why the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand was uh, the technical cause of war. But in fact, that was a war that both sides had been preparing for for decades prior to its actual outbreak. And that is one of the characteristics of modern capitalism, of, of imperialism, uh, this tendency towards war. And uh, the war takes different forms. One, of course, which I've just been describing, is a war between capitalist powers, but also wars to suppress national independence and suppress social change. So that uh, when the Russian Revolution occurred, uh, almost two dozen capitalist powers sent troops or otherwise intervened in order to try to overthrow the new workers' government there. And we see examples of that everywhere. The Vietnam War uh, is, is an example, but the uh, the actions of the United States and other countries in opposing the socialist revolution in China, uh, in Korea, in uh, various parts of the world, uh, and uh, close to home, we have Cuba, uh, which is constantly under the threat of war. And uh, it's become a hot war at one point during the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, so uh, in addition to that, once the anti-colonial movement got going uh, after about 19, uh, well, 56 or 1960 in Africa, then uh, the capitalist powers were very active in suppressing these national independence movements. And the support that they got internationally was primarily from the Soviet Union. And, uh, but this suppression of national independence still goes on. And uh, it's, it's a constant theme and an aspect of imperialism. So let's, Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the aspects of, uh, of monopoly capitalism or imperialism uh, in the United States and uh, especially. Uh, one of the aspects of modern capitalism and imperialism is the phenomenon of what we might call super profits uh, or extra profits that are created by the imposition and enforcement of racism, of sexism, of various forms of discrimination against groups of people. Um, the, uh, going through those, uh, racism uh, has been associated with capitalism ever since its beginnings, especially in the United States. Uh, the emergence of capitalism as a, as a major dominant form of the economy is something that occurred uh, pretty much simultaneously and their related phenomenon with the uh, colonial capture and subjugation of the new world of South America, of uh, North America. And that involved the uh, the repression and in many cases, the genocide against native peoples there. Uh, with, the, uh, with the establishment of colonial rule in the new world, the process of kidnapping people from Africa 
uh, in large numbers and exporting them to uh, the new world as slaves uh, became commonplace, both in North and South America. And uh, in order to justify it, because uh, you know what possible justification uh, in a capitalist country which recognized what is sometimes laughingly called free labor, but uh, but which which had overcome to some degree the uh, the fetters of feudalism. Uh, how do you justify slavery? Well, you develop an ideology that says that certain groups of people, in this case, uh, people with darker skins who uh, came from a different continent, uh, from Africa, in, in this case, for the most part, uh, are inferior or inherently slaves. And uh, so side by side with the development of, uh, of imperialist uh, capitalist penetration in uh, the countries of, uh, or in the continents of North and South America, we saw the emergence of racism uh, as a justification for the slavery that was used in order to exploit these countries. Uh, sexism has been very deeply embedded in every class-based human society, not only capitalism, but certainly including capitalism. And uh, its cultural roots go very, very deep and uh, it's something that has carried over into modern society uh, in various forms. And uh, these, two, uh, these two aspects of discrimination in particular uh, lead to what we call super exploitation. That is extra profits from discrimination because in addition to the uh, I, I hesitate to use the word normal, but I'll, I'll use that, the normal or typical level of profit that's associated with the with capitalist exploitation. Uh, we also see extra profits being extracted from uh, these groups of workers, uh, from racially oppressed groups, from immigrants, as immigrants became an important part of the workforce, uh, especially in the new world, but now it's an international phenomenon almost everywhere, uh, and women, uh, which of course are present in every society. Uh, and what it means economically is that these workers are paid less than the value of their labor power, uh, which is to say uh, the value of their labor power was like every other commodity is what it costs to produce it. And these uh, super exploited workers are paid less than what is normally required in order to reproduce that labor power. And so they live it in substandard conditions and <clears throat> with, with substandard compensation. So, According to Victor Perlow, who is a communist, American communist uh, economist, domestic super profits, that is within the United States from wage and income differentials due to racism, uh, totaled $150 billion back in 1984. Um, it's since that time, uh, probably the number has doubled or tripled at least. Uh, the effect of, of racism on levels of profits. Combined with the super exploitation of workers in other countries, profits from racism accounted for about one third of the total property income in the United States in 1984. And that's why racism and sexism and uh, other forms of, of special discrimination against uh, immigrants and other groups of people uh, against LGBTQ people, uh, these are not incidental. These are a major and fairly central part of the viability of the capitalist system in the modern world, and especially in the United States. Now, the, the chief source of this extra profits uh, is these discriminatory wage differentials. But 
it's not because white male workers are being paid more than the value of their labor, but it's because other workers are being paid less. And so the idea that white male workers benefit from discrimination is uh, scientifically, it's, it's fallacious, it's wrong, it's not true. Uh, and in addition, these specially oppressed groups lose income because of uh, unequal levels of unemployment, uh, unemployment because they are frequently employed in occupations that uh, do not contribute to profits. And, uh, and for example, uh, a person who is forced to be a domestic housekeeper uh, is not contributing to anybody's profit. And as a matter of, uh, what happens is that the amount of money available to pay that person is typically the uh, pressures on paying them substandard wages. And, uh, and they're not able to organize to get a proportional share of the surplus value. But these extra profits are not the only purpose of racism, sexism, and homophobia. A really important uh, role that they play, uh, an increasingly important role that they play today, uh, as struggles against discrimination have shown some success and have overcome some of the level of, uh, of disparity and discrimination. But they're used and always have been used to prevent the unity of the working class. As long as you can tell a white male worker, don't complain, uh, you're a lot better off than, than that woman than that black person, than that Mexican immigrant, uh, then it creates a barrier to, uh, to the working class working together in order to confront the capitalists and extract a larger share of the value that is contrib contributed by the workers themselves. And these attacks on sections of the working class uh, racist attacks, uh, sexist attacks, homophobic attacks, uh, anti-immigrant attacks, they facilitate a broad anti-labor offensive by capital. Now, I don't have to explain that to anybody who's been awake for the last uh, half dozen years. Uh, it's the very essence of Trumpism. And Trumpism is the spearhead of uh, the anti-labor offensive by capital. Uh, and this assault against the working class, any assault against the working class as a whole, hits with exceptional severity against the uh, specially oppressed sectors of the working class. So that when you put limitations on the right to unionize, when you put uh, downward pressure on wages, it's the specially oppressed groups of, pe of people in the working class who are hit the hardest. And then uh, finally, uh, I would mention, uh, and it, it's very relevant to the politics of today, the uh, uh, and what Trumpism represents. Discrimination puts democracy itself at risk. That as long as discrimination is widespread, as long as a significant portion of the working class uh, is uh, immobilized by discrimination and by racism and sexism, then democracy itself is not safe. Now, uh, let's talk a minute about unemployment. We're going through a period right now uh, where unemployment is at historically low levels in the United States. Uh, we know that's a temporary condition, but it's significant. Um, it's important and it's not a bad thing. Uh, but in general, as the productivity of labor grows under capitalism, more goods and services are produced by fewer and fewer workers. And this leads to the creation of what Marx termed the Industrial Reserve Army, which is a permanent, although it's varying, it's not always the same size, but it's a permanent feature of the capitalist economy. And for the capitalists, this reserve army of unemployed provides a number of benefits. 
in times of prosperity, it provides a pool of additional workers to expand production and with that expand profits. In times of recession, it enables the capitalists to cut wages and recoup dwindling profits uh, that result from the recession so that it enables the capitalists to put the onus and the burden of unemployment and the recession itself on the workers rather than uh, on the capitalist. Currently, we're experiencing what historically is quite an unusual period of low unemployment, which uh, it's right now uh, significantly under 4% according to official statistics. And one of the consequences of that is that workers have more freedom to change jobs and demand higher wages. So if you've been stuck in a job that you hate, uh, that has no prospects, that uh, has bad working conditions and poor wages, um, you are not quite so terrified about the consequences of changing jobs or demanding higher wages because there are other opportunities that seem to be in existence. Now, employment, employers, and I would include with that their government, and I use that term uh, very consciously, their government, not our government, uh, they perceive this reduction in the reserve army of unemployed as a threat to profits, and it is. Um, it's when the reserve un army of unemployed is too small, then, and workers have more options, and have more leverage, then certainly it affects profits. And so what's the reaction of the government? Well, the, the agency in the US government that is charged with uh, dealing with, uh, with these matters is called the Federal Reserve Bank. And there are no workers that sit on the board of the Federal Reserve. Uh, it represents big business, it represents bankers, it represents uh, monopoly capitalists. And the Federal Reserve, as everybody knows from reading the newspapers, uh, has been aggressively raising interest rates to so-called cool the economy. In other words, to create more unemployment and bring unemployment to what they regard as a healthy level. Uh, under 4% is not healthy. 6% uh, would be a lot healthier, unless you're an unemployed worker. And uh, the explanation that uh, we hear and that we read about in the newspapers, almost without exception, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a conservative media source like the Wall Street Journal or MSNBC um, or, uh, or any other, we he hear that what causes inflation primarily is, uh, is, is that workers are getting paid too well. And as a result of that, the price of goods goes up. And then the price of goods going up means that workers uh, want more money so they can buy the more expensive goods. And uh, one thing leads to another. So it becomes a, an upward spiral, what is called the wage price spiral. This was a very popular term back during the Nixon administration when uh, in the wake of, of, or during the latter part of the Vietnam War and in the wake of that war, prices were going up very dramatically. And that was explained by this theory of the wage price spiral. So what did the government do about it th then? Well, it said it was going to impose wage and uh, price controls. In fact, the wage controls were imposed effectively, the price controls not. And so it was very one-sided uh, government response. And as a result of that, uh, during a time when workers should have been getting very significant wage increases uh, and monopolies should have been faced with limitations on how they could drive prices up, we saw exactly the opposite. So uh, I, I think that that example is uh, very telling about why we need to study and understand Marxist political economy, because uh, where are you going to read about this in the New York Times, in the Washington Post? Are you going to see it on television, on uh, any uh, on any widespread popular media? That the actual cause of inflation uh, is excessive profits, 
it's not uh, that workers are being paid too much. Now, I'd like to get into a little bit now uh, a definition and an understanding of what social class is, because that's a question that comes up a lot among people who are uh, becoming involved in the working class movement. And uh, there's a lot of uh, not just confusion, but vagueness about how people understand this term. Well, Lenin provided us with a very precise and rather formal definition, um, which I think is worth studying. You probably won't memorize it by my just reading it here, but uh, classes are large groups of people differing from each other by the place they occupy in a historically determined system of social production. In this case, we're talking about capitalism. That's our historically determined system of social production and by their relationship, in most cases, fixed and formulated in law, but not always, uh, to the means of production. So uh, what's, their, what's their relationship to the means of production? Do they own it? Do they work at it? Uh, do they control it? And by their role in the social organization of labor, and consequently in the dimensions of the share of social wealth of which they dispose and the mode of acquiring it. Basically, that means uh, who gets how much. And so one class of people, uh, their role in relation to the means of production is to work at them. And another group of people is to own them. And the different groups get different shares of the social wealth and they acquire it in different ways. One group acquires it by being paid wages when they're able to find work. And the other group uh, acquires it by uh, receiving profits. So that, that's the essence of this. And this definition applies to any social system uh, after, uh, after the emergence of the human race from just tribal economies. But it applies to slave, uh, early primitive slave societies like ancient Egypt and Greece. It applies to feudalism, it applies to capitalism. So let's look at who are the capitalists, because there are a lot of people who think, well, uh, I own a pizza parlor, so I'm a capitalist. Um, that's sort of true, but uh, the general I think the general definition here, one from uh, John Eaton's book, which is on the recommended reading list, uh, capitalists are a class of persons possessed of wealth in the money form and owning the means of production, uh, which are set to work by hiring workers. So they're people who have money and they own the means of production and then they can hire workers to do the work. In terms of uh, how many people they are. If we go back to that uh, definition of classes, the start of it was there are large groups of people. And so the capitalist class in the United States is not the richest hundred people in the country. They're, they're a large group of people. They're about 1% of the population. So that means uh, two or three million people, um, the capitalists and their families. And uh, so they're a significant group. They're not, uh, it's, it's not just a couple of people, but they're, uh, they're the 1%. They're not, uh, they're nowhere close to a majority or even a, a significant minority. Uh, and within that capitalist class, how is the wealth distributed? Uh, it's distributed uh, not evenly, but there's extreme concentration near the top. So that the very wealthiest people, the uh, couple hundred billionaires in the United States, uh, control and own uh, a vastly disproportionate amount of the money that belongs to the entire capitalist class. Uh, so there are the ultra super rich billionaire group of capitalists, and then there are those who are just worth a couple million each, or a couple of tens or hundreds of millions who are the less wealthy capitalist. 
but the capitalist class itself is not a monolith and different sections of it behave differently. And the reason for that is uh, different sections of the capitalist class represent different industries and economic interests. Uh, so uh, for example, one part of the uh, capitalist class represents people in the extractive industries, uh, oil and mining and so forth. Uh, another group uh, in the retail industries, another group in uh, uh, semiconductors or uh, in uh, uh, just various other forms of, of high-tech industry. And the social interests and the economic interests of those parts of the capitalist class are different and they affect their behavior, their political and cultural behavior differently. There are also different levels of concentration of capital. There are some industries where the concentration of capital is really, really intense. So there are just a few companies. Uh, look, for example, at the, uh, the companies that make cell phones, uh, just a very, very few. And you have other companies, you have other industries where there is uh, more, uh, uh, more distribution of the concentration of capital. Um, I'm thinking maybe of uh, uh, machinery production, where there might be uh, dozens or even hundreds of companies, all of which are they're multi-billion dollar companies, but they're less concentrated, say, than Apple uh, or Microsoft. And there's also different historical experiences. Uh, there are still a few industries left where there is historically a high level of unionization. Um, an industry that I worked in for a lot of my life was the utility industry. And the utility industry is still pretty well unionized, uh, pretty high level. And that affects the behavior, not only of the workers, but also of the capitalists in that industry. Um, there are also different experiences with the intensity of racial and sex discrimination and which has historically been more intense in some industries than in others. And there are also different relationships to foreign military and trade policies. And that helps to explain the extremely reactionary nature of the extractive industries, especially oil and gas, uh, and the capitalists in those industries. And because of the extreme concentrations of wealth at the top, the personal preferences of individual big capitalists can affect their political behavior. So uh, uh, you could just, again, pick up the newspaper and look at what Elon Musk has been up to today. Or conversely, there are a few big capitalists who are a little bit more liberal. And uh, that is just uh, a reflection of the fact that the individual differences do make some of a, have some effect on that behavior. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot, and it's appropriate and we have to, because it's something that we are, have been faced with in a very urgent way for the last couple of decades, really, and uh, maybe more immediately in the last few years, is the threat of fascism. And why is it that we are faced with a more urgent threat of fascism today than we were maybe uh, 30 or 40 years ago? Um, well, uh, I think we have to start with what fascism is. And I think just defining it is a very important thing because uh, if you uh, go to Wikipedia and find a definition of fascism, you'll come up with a couple of different definitions. If you look at various liberal or conservative commentators, they will focus on one aspect or another of fascism. But what the communist analysis leads us to is to focus on the class basis of fascism. And uh, Georgi Dimitrov, who was a great Bulgarian communist and leader of the Communist International during the 1930s, uh, he came up with this definition of fascism. It's the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, the most chauvinistic, uh, which means the most racist and nationalist, and the most imperialist sections of finance capital. 
So Dimitrov focused on the class basis of fascism, whereas a lot of uh, the more popular definitions that you read about in the newspaper and in the media focus on the makeup of some of the followers of fascism, um, many of whom uh, either come out of the working class or of other uh, uh, semi-working class elements or sometimes small capitalists and what we call petty bourgeoisie. But Dimitrov focused on the fact that fascism was in fact the uh, ideology and uh, the strategy of a section of the biggest sections of uh, finance capital. Uh, now, different sections of the capitalist class have different interests, hence they have different agendas. Uh, in, gender, in general, those engaged in the extractive industries like oil and gas and mining and the armaments industry and the export of capital to less developed countries tend towards fascism. For much of the rest of the work of the capitalist class, liberal democracy, with strong protection, of course, for property rights, provides a more favorable business and social climate, and so more opportunities for profit uh, under normal conditions. So the capitalist class is not united around an approach towards fascism and democracy. Um, then we have to look at uh, who makes up the working class. Well, the working class is constant, the composition of it is dynamic. It changes the forms of production and distribution and exchange are constantly developing. Uh, the working class includes workers themselves and their families. And I think um, in Marxist thinking, there has been a move away from just focusing on uh, people who work on the man involved in the manufacture of uh, commodities, uh, of material commodities like food and clothing and mines, uh, machines, so forth, to other groups of workers as well, which more accurately reflects the makeup and the organization of modern economy. So production by workers includes, of course, uh, the production of material commodities, food, clothing, machines. Uh, it includes the production of non-material commodities, such as computer software. Uh, it also includes now, I think, the distribution of commodities because distribution and transportation has become an integral part of the production process itself. And it's hard to draw a bright line between those. Uh, we also have to talk about uh, the, uh, the value that is created by workers in healthcare and teaching in government services and in the production of cultural products uh, such as art and performances and uh, movies and so forth. And in all of these areas, workers produce uh, goods and commodities, and uh, they also produce uh, surplus value, which is not uh, remitted to them in their compensation. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, the uh, some of this is at variance with uh, some of what you may have read uh, in analyses of Marx's uh, uh, analysis of of what uh, of, of who were actually parts of the working class. But uh, there's a more recent book by uh, a leader of the American Communist Party, our Communist Party, uh, who passed away a few years ago, Daniel Rubin. Uh, who does some analysis of this. Uh, it's just a brief part of his book. Um, his book is called Can Capitalism Last? And uh, he goes into a discussion of this and actually finds some references of some of the thinking of Marx about these subjects. So uh, we're about at the end of my presentation. It's taken a little bit longer than I expected, but uh, Hopefully you have been able to take away some of these things. First, what are the characteristics of imperialism? Uh, who makes up the modern working class? What is the composition of the capitalist class today? And what is super exploitation and what are its implications? So um, I have some recommended reading here, uh, which uh, 
is the list that was also presented uh, in the last class, uh, Political Economy by John Eaton, Super Profits and Crises by Victor Perlow, Wage, Labor and Capital and Value, Price and Profit by Karl Marx, and Imperialism uh, by Lenin, uh, and then the Daniel Rubin book, Can Capitalism Last? Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, turn uh, the mic over to Molly, who is going to be uh, uh, sort of oversee and, and give some direction to the questions and answers and comment period of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. So my name is Molly and I'm gonna open the discussion period for this class. Uh, to begin with, I need to explain um, what you must do uh, to introduce a question or comment. So the first thing is to indicate that you want to speak by clicking the picture of the hand. The second step is to open your mic on your end by clicking the picture of the microphone. And then you'll need to wait for your name to be called. I will open your mic and then you'll be able to speak uh, and briefly introduce your comment and or question. So again, please indicate you want to speak by clicking the picture of the raised hand. And I see Christopher Payne. I'm going to open your mic. You'll need to open your mic on your end. Christopher Payne, there you go. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you, go ahead. Hi, um, I, I didn't have a question in particular. Uh, I'm a new member to the uh, uh, Communist Party USA and uh, I was just listening, I was able to uh, uh, get into part one uh, two couple of days ago, and then I missed the. Now I, I was able to come online and catch this. I didn't have a particular question at this time. I'm just uh, listening to the commentary and uh, taking notes and um, to further my my understanding of of what uh, is going on in terms of. Um, the capitalist society and a communist society. So um, thank you for, for um, having me on. I didn't know I lit myself up, but uh, that's fine. Uh, I will you. continue to um, participate in um, as much as I can because I'm very much interested in being All involved. Right, thank you for thank you for being here. Um, let's. Uh, Let's hear from other uh, participants. Um, Carol, uh, I'm going to open your mic. If you could open your mic on your end. Carol. Okay, Carol, we can't hear you, so uh, I'm going to close your mic and I'm going to call on Alexis. If you could please uh, unmute yourself, click the mic on your end. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes. Perfect. Hello, it's me again. Um, I was in the last session as well, so thank you for continuing this. I greatly appreciate it. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, but I guess I'll start with the one that seems most pertinent to something I recently read um, regarding the superconductors in Taiwan. <clears throat> so I recently read that Warren Buffett has divested in Taiwan superconductors. Um, I read it on People's Dispatch. It was an article by Vijay Prashad. And I wonder how that has an impact on what we're seeing with US imperialism right now. Um, just 
based on what we talked about with the exportation of capital uh, as a whole. I know that that can be related to offshoring production, but I don't know how that relates to um, investments and divestments in other countries in that way. Um, yeah, like I said, I have other questions, but I'll uh, give other people a chance to ask before why don't you, why don't you I just back one or in. two more questions while you're on, and I'll, you know. Oh, so okay. Can, um, Perfect. Thank you, Carl. Um, okay, so I guess my next question would be, uh, I've heard in some other Marxist-Leninist circles this term called PMC, or um, professional managerial class, and I was curious kind of where they might fall into the spectrum of working class versus capitalism. Um, in my experience, I have seen a lot of people in the managerial class work their butts off. However, I do know um, that they are kind of directly impacting the organization of labor. So I'm, I'm curious kind of where they might fall. Um, and then I guess my other more developed question, because I still had one I was writing down, um, would be kind of related to Tuesday's um, meeting. Tyler asked a question about um, logistics. And I was curious um, specifically about dis uh, distribution in that way, how logistics might be related to kind of um, distribution cartels or just um, generally related even maybe back to merchant capitalists as a whole. Um, that one's not quite as developed either, but thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay. You want to take uh, questions from one or two other people and then I'll start answering? Yes, sounds good. Thank you, Alexis. So uh, I'm going to call on Ale. You are unmuted on our end. There you go. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? All right, all right. So I have a question pertaining to uh, the bank section of the presentation where you were talking about uh, new roles of banks. So the way I understand it, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, and that's particularly why I'm asking this question, but was the new role of banks then followed up by finance capital and then followed up by financial oligarchy or were they kind of separate but they were working together if you get what i'm saying if you get what i'm saying okay thank you so much and one more carl okay uh keenan terry your mic is open if you could open it on your end to introduce your question, there you go. Of course, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so this is, I guess, a bit of a broad question. I hope you can maybe address a little bit for me um, and for the others as well. My background is in um, physics and mathematics as well as computer science. And um, I guess to um, preface my question, um, even I've always had the fascination with science as a child and especially getting into the academic side of it as I um, got into my um, uh, college education, it felt to me like it was rather self-evidently um, obvious that I guess the epistemological basis of a lot of natural sciences, which is I guess called physicalism and socialist materialism are at least in my subjective opinion, to, to my understanding of both personally, uh, basically compatible. And in my in my opinion, socialist economics have always been kind of, in my opinion, the obvious better of many different models throughout the history. So my question is, do you get much contribution um, from people in uh, the natural sciences, uh, I guess, regarding physics and biology, um, even theoretical ones more like mathematics, as well as computer science. And um, if you do or don't, um, how do you get contributions from them? Or do you take inspiration from them? And, um, or perhaps what you would like to do to try to reach out to those uh, fields to um, 
get contribution from them because I believe that their input would be very valuable to um, uh, the communist cause, basically. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, go. All those are great questions. Uh, let me go through them uh, sort of in order. Uh, the the situation around uh, the uh, Taiwan semiconductor industry and the uh, fact that uh, Warren Buffett and his company Berkshire Hathaway has decided to withdraw its uh, its investments from that area um, is uh, it's actually uh, very interesting from a lot of different directions. Uh, it's the uh, a lot of semiconductor manufacture takes place in Taiwan, and uh, a lot of it at a very high technical level, which uh, is probably as great or greater as uh, that exists anywhere else in the world. And apparently, Buffett has decided that uh, in the longer run, that the prospects of Taiwan staying capitalist. Uh, are shaky because of the fact that historically and legally it's part of uh, the People's Republic of China uh, and is just a separate country because of the fact that the losing side in this Chinese civil war was able to move their army to Taiwan and and, uh, and maintain control with the help of the United States military. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as a longer term prospect, uh, it may not be so promising to stay as part of the U.S. financial empire. And uh, so I think that's perhaps part of what's involved with that. And there's also an increasing recognition that um, even areas where there has been a technological monopoly of the United States or by countries that are controlled or strongly influenced by the United States, uh, that, that monopoly won't continue forever. And so it's kind of an unstable situation, I think. And it reflects the fact that capitalism itself and imperialism is unstable and is constantly developing. Uh, and uh, it's there's also a potential of a threat of war there because in order for uh, China to assert its uh, its sovereign rights over what's historically part of its national territory, uh, the United States might be prepared to go to war over that. So um, anyway, uh, a, a smart capitalist investor like Warren Buffett perhaps has decided to hedge his bets by uh, withdrawing from that particular area. <clears throat> um, the uh, Talking about the professional managerial class, uh, where uh, people who are high-level managers in capitalist co companies uh, are not themselves all the time large capitalists. They they may be fairly well-to-do. They might even be worth, uh, in terms of personal wealth, a few million dollars, but they're not major parts of the capitalist class. But they're fully integrated in the functioning of the capitalist system. Uh, that uh, is not necessarily true of uh, people farther down the management chain. And because, especially because of the fact that uh, we see large numbers or large parts of the workforce, uh, which requires very high levels of technical training and expertise and uh, especially in high-tech industries. And uh, those are now really part of the working class. So I think we have to make a distinction between people who are the in the managerial group and people who uh, may have high levels of technical qualification, but aren't themselves uh, managers uh, and have to be considered as a part of the working class. Uh, the whole area of logistics and distribution, um, I would really refer, rather than me spending a whole lot of time on it in this class, I would refer people to uh, that book by Daniel Rubin, and it's just a few pages in there. I think it's pages 13, 39 and 40, in which he has a very interesting discussion of this, which uh, I won't take the time here to read it, but <laughs> uh, I recommend it to people. It's uh, it's really worth looking at. Um, the 
uh, in terms of the new roles of banks and the financial uh, oligarchy, the, um, the banks during the time of Marx mainly were in the business of being depositories of money. They, uh, people who had money would deposit the money and then the banks would invest it. And what happened with the emergence of imperialism is that bankers uh, or industrialists found it useful, sometimes necessary, to have banks that could provide them with uh, the services that they needed, the access to large amounts of capital. And then the banks themselves found that it was useful to have control over industry. And so it wasn't like one took over the other, they, uh, they merged. And we have now, uh, well, we started to see things like uh, even back during the 1920s, you had the Mellon banks and the Morgan banks uh, who got, uh, who were started out as, as banks uh, accruing um, or pulling together large, large amounts of money from investors uh, taking over in industries. And uh, the, the communist economist uh, uh, who wrote one of the books that was recommended here, uh, it's Victor Perlow, uh, he wrote a book back in the 19, late 1930s, I think, called The Empire of High Finance, in which he describes these groupings of industries and banks that merged together. Uh, and so you had a couple of, you had the Morgan banks, you had the Mellon banks, you had the Rockefeller banks, uh, and they were competing clusters of, of capitalist power. And uh, that's uh, developed and changed since the time that uh, Perlow was writing. But I think it gives you an insight into how that financial oligarchy uh came into being and how it emerged in the United States. And the same process can be, I'm sure, described in other countries as well. Um, with regard to uh, the, the comment or the question about contributions from people uh, in the natural sciences, um, I wasn't sure whether you meant political contributions or financial contributions or what, but, uh, but in either case, uh, Actually, yeah, we're seeing some pretty new phenomena here because while uh, it's certainly true that uh, there was never a time when there were no scientists who were involved in the socialist movement. Uh, you know, um, Albert Einstein was a uh, very fervent uh, advocate of, of socialism. And uh, there were other uh, notable scientists in that category, but some things have happened since then. One is that a much larger portion of our population are people who are highly qualified in the sciences. So rather than being a very small percentage of the population, it's actually become very considerable. There are a lot of people around who have PhDs and other advanced degrees in the natural sciences. And, um, and so uh, that's, changed some of the makeup of society as a whole. But I work with the party, with the Communist Party's membership uh, commission and or committee. And so I see a lot of applications of new members. And uh, it's actually very striking how many people we're attracting to our party who have uh, strong scientific backgrounds, who are professional scientists and engineers. And that's a change. It used to be that uh, it was pretty unusual, I think, to have engineers who were attracted to the Communist Party. But now, uh, I think because people with those qualifications and those backgrounds are treated more and more like workers. And so they're coming to realize that, yeah, that's what they are, they're workers. And so they have the same interests that other workers have, uh, whether they have PhDs in biochemistry or whether they're, uh, a carpenter, um, they still uh, have the same basic relationship to capitalism. And uh, and I think this is a very, it's an exciting thing for our party because it means that we are having an infusion of people with a lot of uh, 
sophistication and understanding of important parts of our economy that uh, perhaps we didn't have access to in the past. So um, we're coming to the close of the period. I, maybe we have time for another question or so. Molly, okay, we can, yeah, we can try. Um, just as a reminder, uh, if you want to speak, you need to open your mic on your end by clicking the image of the mic. Um, Carol, I'm going to give you another try here. Your mic is now open, so you need to click the mic on your hand on your end. Okay, Carol, we need to move on. Um, Miguel, click the mic on your end. There you go. Hey, what's up, y'all? You can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Cool. I am enjoying myself so much in this series. I just want to say uh, thank y'all so much for this information. Uh, I, I live in the Caribbean. I'm in Puerto Rico. And I was wondering, uh, talking about imperialism, um, what what are some interest industries, whether over history or uh, throughout history, or, or like recently, right right now, what are the in some of the industries that have been either like the most exploitative of Caribbean or Latin American nations, um, or like have that any like high profile anything that's high profile that we're seeing that that has been leveraged against the interest of smaller uh, colonies of the empires like. Uh, USA and France and uh, in UK, stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. And is that it or one more? Let's try one more. All right, Rebecca, your mic is open on our end. Please open your mic, click the picture of the mic to open on your end. Okay, we're gonna have to move on, Rebecca. John, the mic is open on your end. Please open the mic. There you go. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, I just wanted to know if, if you had your eye on any areas of tension in today's world that you think could like spark any kind of political economic change, the kind that we've been talking about. And that is it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, with re in response to Miguel, um, I, uh, I haven't myself made a separate study of uh, the Caribbean and uh, industries there, but I probably know a little bit about uh, just what is common knowledge. Obviously, a lot of the production in the Caribbean countries involves agriculture, and uh, you know, very famously, sugar, uh, which is produced in places like Puerto Rico and I think Dominican Republic. Uh, coffee is another uh, product, and uh, and certain other agricultural goods. As well as that, extractive industries are pretty important there are large deposits of certain minerals uh, in some of the Caribbean countries that uh, are exploited by uh, mostly U.S. companies. And um, uh, the, uh, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, certain industries that involve, well, uh, oil, I should mention. Uh, there's uh, in the areas around uh, well, uh, parts of the of the Caribbean, the parts that are close to uh, Venezuela, uh, Trinidad, and so forth, uh, there are significant uh, resources of oil and natural gas, and uh, so uh, there is also uh, quite a bit of manufacture in certain countries. Uh, Haiti comes to mind. Uh, I think Puerto Rico as well. Of uh, that, that involves products uh, like like garments, like uh, uh, textiles, and so forth. Um, but as I say, I, I haven't really made a study of this, and uh, but I think those are all important areas. And the 
ownership in most cases is uh, by U.S. corporations, and U.S. corporations uh, very intensively exploit people in those areas. And uh, the uh, it's probably particularly exacerbated in a place like uh, Puerto Rico, where uh, which is uh, still uh, pretty much an open colony of the United States and has been since it was uh, taken over by the U.S. And uh, we would hope to be able to see a future for Puerto Rico uh, in a progressive and positive direction like Cuba has taken. So I, I don't know if that answers the question sufficiently, but we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, uh, John asked, uh, areas of, uh, uh, that, that may spark change. I, I think in the world that we live today, uh, that could be almost anything. Uh, a lot of times uh, changes erupt in places where you're not watching them or not expecting them to happen. Uh, I think uh, the key thing here is that imperialism is the it's the highest stage of capitalism but it's also capitalism that is ripe for the transition to socialism and uh that is true everywhere not just in the uh less developed world but in the uh advanced world as well uh the industrial advanced world and what's really necessary uh you know th those are what we call the objective factors uh but what is not always right yet is the subjective factors. That is the working class and its uh, political representatives and advocates, and particularly the communist parties, have to be in a position where they uh, are capable of giving leadership and direction to the working class. And then uh, those struggles have to emerge. And uh, and, and all this has, has is happening in the context of a very dangerous situation where you have significant portions of the capitalist ruling class in the United States and in other countries, which is quite prepared to destroy the human race rather than see it become socialist. And that, that's not, I'm not being exaggerating or anything there. I think you look at people like Donald Trump and it's absolutely true. <laughs> Uh, it's what we should have learned from the experience during uh, the 1930s and 40s with fascism in Germany and Italy, uh, Romania and uh, Japan and some other countries. And uh, we have to be on our guard and be constantly working to make sure that the transition to socialism, which is necessary and I think is inevitable, uh, not be uh, brought to a halt by the destruction of the world itself. And that means that we have to fight both for democracy and for socialism and uh, for all of the things that people need in order to live uh, and develop decently. So with that, I'm gonna uh, call an end to this and thank you all for your participation and uh, excellent questions. And I look forward to meeting a lot of you in person and uh, working with you in the future. Good night. Thank you, comrade. And we had 10 more questions or more. So thank you again. Uh, lots of engagement. Uh, thanks to everyone for participating tonight. And we'll see you at the next class. Good night.